We are very excited and grateful to have Dr. Andrew Abdullah Hauk with us today. Abdullah Hauk is a Marid of Sidi Muhammad al Jamal of Jerusalem since 2007 and lives in the Happy Canyon of Oregon's Thai Valley with his wife Shamsa. Abdullah and Shamsa have been integral beloveds in a number of Sufi communities in the United States, including Minnesota. <laughs> they lived in Minneapolis for a period of time and brought great energy enthusiasm and wisdom to our community. I remember shortly after they arrived in Minnesota, Abdullah called me and asked me to tell him about the community. I responded with a few generalities and he pressed me to describe our community to him in much more detail. It was one of my first experiences with the intensity, the dedication and the commitment he brings to all of his endeavors, particularly this holy Sufi family, which he has dedicated himself to. His teaching today is what it means to follow the Shadliya Tariqa according to the teachings of Sidi Muhammad and a recitation of Al Wadifatu Mashashia. Abdullah, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Abdullah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, um, looks like I've got some feedback. No, that's fixed. Alhamdulillah. So I'm going to start the way our guide always started his talks with the elongation of the kalimat at tahid the invocation of unity la ilaha illallah la Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. We praise him and seek his help and his forgiveness. And we take refuge in him from the evil in our own selves and from shameful deeds. Whoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whoever Allah leads astray, there's no one to guide them. 
I testify that there is no such thing as a God that we can conceptualize or comprehend, but there is only Allah. And I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. A logistical note. First, I wanna ask that you don't take notes during this talk. Uh, I just wanna connect with your hearts, inshallah. And if you can follow along and be present, that would be best. This is a more intellectual teaching lasting about 45 minutes, which does require an exercise in attention. If you want to go back and listen again, they are recording this teaching, so you can go back, inshallah. And after the teaching, after the talk, my brother has been asking me to do a recording of the wadifa, so I hope to do that. Uh, when the recording is published, I don't think there'll be time for questions right after this, but you can ask questions on the YouTube chat forum, and I will go on there from time to time and do my best to answer them. Or you can use the community directory and get in touch with me that way. Thank you again to Abdullah and the Minnesota community for hosting these calls. And thanks to Amina and all those who worked so hard to preserve the Sufi teachings that Sidi Muhammad brought from his teachers. And thank you to my beloved mirror, my sunshine, for helping me to craft this talk. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is a blessed day, one of the holy days. We're in the first 10 days of the month of Dhul Hijjah, and this is a special time where you can make the deep repentance for any mistakes, and you can renew your promise with Allah, a promise to walk straight and to take care of your bodies and your hearts and your secrets. I ask Allah to be generous with you and to fill you with love and mercy for the whole world and for your families and for your children. And I ask him to help us to follow the way of the prophets, the way of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and Muhammad, the deep peace and blessings be upon them. I'd like to share something personal. I'm giving a talk on the topic of following our way, our tariqa, what to follow, who to follow, and how to follow. But I must confess, I'm aware that in my heart, I want followers. I'm aware that I want a position of leadership and esteem, and I want people to follow me and what I make from myself. So you should remember that only Allah and his messengers are worthy of being followed, and that anything I say that is not aligned to their message is wrong, and you should disregard it. Now, as you may know, we are in the habit of calling our spiritual community a tariqa. The word literally means the way which you follow to purify your heart and become elevated to reach your complete humanity. It is an aspect of the term deen, which is a way of life that repays the debt that we incur to Allah by growing and developing into our individual selves or our nafs. You can think of the word nafs as your ego as we go through this talk. The most noble deen is the prophetic way of life. We call that deen Islam, whether it was brought by Musa or Isa or Muhammad. The tariqa is the inner aspect of this noble way of life. So calling the community by that name can confuse people, it can, as to what to follow in order to attain that noble goal. And becoming, as our guide says, the prophet of your time. 
So let's set it straight. Our community, our national community is an organization, a spiritually based organization, but an organization of the world nonetheless. Its purpose is dealing with the logistics of the community in the world. It's not necessarily a representation of the tariqa. Its purpose is one, to support newcomers in establishing their Islam, two, to bring them to the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah and to help them to understand them with a Gnostic understanding, and three, to provide places to do retreat in order to exercise their traveling to Allah through the prescribed practices. It's also responsible for collecting and distributing charitable donations to deserving people. Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful community. However, an important perspective to remember also is that the organization is focused on its own growth. The founder had a vision of two million people coming to this path, mashallah. And I hope that even more than that are transformed by following the prophetic way of life because the world needs it. But with that goal, our community members have in the past been encouraged to quote, find their platform in order to share the teachings and the love and to bring others into the community. And for that, we also adopted a ranking system that has Sufi style names, such as Naqib and Muqaddam and Murabbi and, and, and. So that the longer you are in the community and the more you step into managerial positions or bring others into the community, the more you advance through this ranking system. And a subconscious misconception in such a system is that a higher rank means a more purified relationship with Allah. Now, I am reminded of my brother Saleh Kent, who was Sidi Muhammad's right-hand man and sat up there next to him in the teachings and read the books that Sidi would teach from. He never had a rank, but he recounts that early on, he was sitting and eating a meal in a group, thinking to himself, how special he was that he got to be at Sidi's side. And just then, Sidi turned to him and said, Saleh, I have you sit next to me because you are the most needy of any of them. <laughs> Made me laugh so hard. It is so important to be needy for Allah. There's a deep, deep message there. And so, we also see that focusing too much on your own grandeur is a mistake. And following and promoting pictures that people have made up develops a cult of personality where people charge money or think that they have to pay money to learn some process that allows them to access their connection with Allah. And Allah says about this, and when they ask you about me, so know that I am near, nearer than your jugular vein. And he also says, believe in my revelations, which confirm your scriptures. Do not be the first to deny them or sell them for a fleeting gain. And be on guard of yourself for me. And the truth is no one knows the inner heart or station of anyone else, unless they're the inheritor of the prophetic spirit. And so it is best to treat everyone as a beloved brother or sister and to walk your own path. And as our beloved guide would say, don't stop with any picture. So how do you take the way if not by following someone else? The best example and the most worthy to follow is the Prophet Muhammad, the last messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was elected the first caliph, he said, obey me as long as I obey Allah and his prophet. 
And if I disobey him and his prophet, then obey me not. And so we finally come to the meat of the discussion, how to follow the blessed example of the messenger of Allah. Bear with me, because first we have to define some terms. Because tasawwuf, which is another word for Sufism, is, after all, a science. It is the divinely rooted developmental psychology. And as with any science, we need well-defined terms so that we can measure outcomes. And as the saying goes, when you can measure, you can manage. And so CD says that the objects of study in Sufism are the nafs, the heart, and the secret. We measure these in ourselves against the stations of human existence as described in the Sufi teachings. And we manage them by striving with the prescribed practices. It's very scientific. When these are refined, the nafs, the heart, and the secret, then a person may be called Sufi or purified. It is said that a Sufi is like the earth. Every ugly thing is thrown on them, but they only give forth the good. They're trampled by the good doers and the bad. A Sufi is disconnected from created things and is connected to the ever-present reality, the haq. Sufis are as children in the lap of reality, watched over, provided for, and lovingly supported in their wondrous exploration. And you can say, I want my Sufism to look like such and such, or I like this part of the path, but not that part of the path. But for the ones who really want to attain refinement in their nafs and their heart and their secret, and to attain knowledge of the knower of the unseen, to die to themselves and to gain life in Allah, and to take on every exalted character trait. For them, the path is one. Our guide says, Tasawwuf was the custom of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the Tabi'een, the ones who followed them, and the Tabi'ihi, the later followers, the inheritors who Allah commanded us to follow and to be guided by their example. The companions, radiallahu anhum, always hastened to surrender to Allah. They were the first to join the way of purification and the first to taste its fruits and secrets. The companions renounced the lower world and made jihad a holy struggle against their nufus, uh, their egos. They loved Allah and his messenger and directed their selves toward the hereafter. They were patient, content, surrendered, and they favored others above themselves. They manifested all the beautiful manners loved by Allah and his messenger. They adorned themselves with beautiful ethics through the tariq of tasawwuf, which gave them proximity to Allah and his messenger. The later followers followed the noble way of the companions, though their rank is considered less than that of the companions. However, generation after generation, and with the passage of time, imposters and innovators began to appear, and people began to compete for worldly things, 
and compassion was set aside. The, no, the lower nafs gets awakened once more and the lights of the heart retreat and corruption spreads within society. It happens over and over throughout history. And this occurred in the Islamic community a century after it was founded. And it continued until it reached a worrisome state that demanded the virtuous inheritors to produce teachings that would preserve and revive the noble way. Sidi Muhammad, rahmatullah alayhi, was such a renewer of the way. From the Hadith of Jibreel, which is a story that I'll share in a moment, we know that the noble way of life has three aspects. For the people of seeking, for the people of wayfaring, and for the people of arrival. The four Imams worked to protect and revive the foundation and created the four madhhabs, the Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali, and Hanafi. These may sound familiar to you if you've been exposed to Islam for a while, which these four are concerned with a, a fiqh, or what we would call jurisprudence. What's the letter of the law in Islam? And among the scholars of the philosophy and theology, the Aqidah of Islam was Al-Ash'ari and his followers, Al-Junaid and his followers are examples of the scholars who protected and revived the aspect of the noble way of life special to those of arrival and completion. He is considered the founder of the Tariqa, the first founder of the Tariqa, which has been revived in many, many places over the years. So following the path requires one to complete their outer and inner way of life. We would say their dunya and their akhira, or their Islam and their iman, or their sharia, and tariqa, but ours is inevitably the way of hakika. So I said I would get to the story. Here's the story. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an said, one day we were sitting in the company of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when there appeared before us a man dressed in pure white clothes, his hair extraordinarily black. There were no signs of travel on him, and none among us recognized him. At last, he sat with the messenger. He knelt before him, placed his palms on his thighs, and said, Muhammad, inform me about Islam. The messenger of Allah said, Al-Islam implies that you testify that there is no such thing as a God, there is only Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and that you establish prayer, pay zakat, which is a charity to the poor, observe and fast Ramadan, and perform pilgrimage to the house if you are able to make the journey. He said, you have told the truth. And it amazed us that he would put the question and then he himself would verify the truth. He then said, inform me about Iman. He replied that you believe in Allah, in his angels, in his holy books, in his messengers, and in the day of judgment. And you believe in the divine decree about good and evil. He said, you have told the truth. He then said, inform me about Al-Ihsan. He said, it is that you worship Allah 
as if you are seeing him before you. For even though you don't see him, he verily sees you. He then said, inform me about the hour. He remarked, the one who is asked knows no more than the one who is inquiring. He said, tell me some of its indications. He said that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and master, that you will find barefooted, destitute goat herds vying with one another in constructing magnificent buildings. And then the man went on his way, but I stayed for a long while. The messenger then said to me, O oh, Abu Abdullah, do you know who this inquirer was? And I replied, Allah and his messenger know best. He remarked, he was the angel Jibreel. He came to teach you in matters of the deen. Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. They're directly related to the nafs, the heart, and the secret, and also the sharia, the tariqah, and the haqiqa. Our guide says that the sharia is for making the outward free from fault, our limbs free from fault. The tariqa is for making the inward free from fault, and the haqiqa is for making the secret free from fault. For this, our guide says that soundness of the outward is based upon three. Repentance, or tauba, with mistakes, which at this level are sins. Guarding oneself, taqwa, against being snagged by the prohibitions of Allah. And uprightness, istiqama, with establishing the obligations that Allah asks of us. Soundness of the inner is also based on three. Serenity, or taslim, that comes from admitting and surrendering ugly qualities and habits. Sincerity, ikhlas, in your practice of virtues and beautiful qualities. And truthfulness, sidq, in pursuing integrity with the Quran and Sunnah. The three things that make the secret sound are watchfulness, muraqaba, in your adab with Allah, your good manners with Allah. Witnessing, mushahada, of the divine outpouring. And gnosis, marifa of the discernment between the stations of existence and how you experience those within yourself so that you can act appropriately when you're in one of these states or stations. Refinement of the outward creates civility and civil society where people are safe. Of course, when you do not commit theft, adultery, or murder, people will naturally trust you. When you make wudu, or uh, ablutions with cold water, and bow and prostrate five times a day, your nervous system is reset from fight or flight mode to rest and digest mode. And you're less likely to react negatively to disappointments and frustrations. When you give from your money to the poor in your community, they will be less likely to commit theft or other crimes. When you fast, you gain compassion for those poor and you engage with them as people. When you expose yourself 
to uncomfortable accommodations and new cultures on a pilgrimage, you become more patient with trials and more open-minded. In the text, the degrees of the soul, which Sidi Muhammad gave to us in the book he published called He Who Knows Himself Knows His Lord, the, right, the author of the degrees of the soul, Sheikh Abdul Khaliq Ash-Shabrawi said, you must not occupy yourself with more than these basics of fiqh before you purify yourself. This is because fiqh or jurisprudence can become a rabbit hole that preoccupies you with the dunya, even though it is the good of the dunya. Our guide used to tell us, don't look left or right. Looking left means to get caught by the haram or harmful things. And looking right means to be too focused on following the letter of the law or to covet the good things of the world. But walking straight means to be with the haq, the reality of the present moment. So that's the refinement of the outer. Refinement of the inner creates honor and dispels hypocrisy. For this, we must study, understand, and believe the Quran and Sunnah. And we must abandon suspicious and doubtful imaginings, purifying and securing our intentions. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, actions are upon their intentions and everyone will get what was intended. Whoever migrates with an intention for Allah and his messenger, the migration will be for the sake of Allah and his messenger. And whoever migrates for worldly gain or to marry a woman, then his migration will be for the sake of whatever he migrated for. For belief in the Quran, our community reads the Quran every year during the 30 days of Ramadan. It's also recommended early on to memorize the protection surahs, which include the three quls and ayat al-kursi. And it's further beneficial to recite Surah Yasin as part of your morning devotions and Surah Waqia as part of your evening devotions. It's also beneficial to memorize some sections of Baqarah and Imran, which are considered to be the two clouds, which give you shade in your hereafter. There's lots and lots of recommended recitations from the Quran that have particular benefits. However, the best way to connect with the Quran is to recite it and to learn what you are saying, bringing the meanings from your heart into harmony with the sound of your voice while you're reciting. This is, it opens up the true miracle of the Quran, which is that it is transformative and it elevates your soul. For aligning with the Sunnah, the Sunnah is the, uh, the manners of, of prophethood that were exemplified by the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our guide for this, our guide suggests to perform the weird, al weird as shadli, after Fajr and Maghrib, and to make dhikr meditation, which is a chanting medita meditation. We would call it mantra in our culture, with the name Allah for an hour a day, preferably at night. The weird, if you don't know, consists of three rounds of meditations which we call dhikr. These are out loud chants and each sound or each, each round, excuse me, represents the journey of the seeker, the wayfarer and the one of arrival. The first is tawba or istighfar. The second, salawat and nabi. And the third is halaya, 
You can find the pronunciations of these elsewhere, but I wanted to help you to understand how to illuminate your experience of the weird. Because practicing these meditations are nourishment that fill up your himma or your desire to strive, like fuel for a vehicle so it can travel and take you through the stations of development of the soul. Now, I, I think there are some confused faces out there because we usually practice the weird with a, with a fourth chant, which is Allah. And that is an additional chant that our guide brought for us. And this is the, the uh, habit of our community. So do it with the four chants. So in order to illuminate what I, what I was thinking about, illuminate your experience of the practices. C.D. talks about a thing of the imagination in his book, uh, The Realities of the Imagination, that we can think of as a temple in the heart. It is a similar concept to what we call in Western psychology, a memory palace, which comes from an ancient Greek memory technique called the method of loci, if you want to study that at a later point. The idea is that you imagine yourself in this temple within your heart, and there are rooms that correspond with each of the three aspects of the noble way, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, Sharia, Tariqa, Hakika. Inside those rooms, you put information and experiences which illuminate your understanding of that topic. And you clean those rooms, purifying them of misconceptions as you go along. If you read the teachings about the Quran and Sunnah, including the Hadith or teachings of the, or teachings of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll most likely to be, be able to distinguish if they correspond to the room dealing with return from worldly mistakes, the room dealing with alignment with higher character and ethics, or the room dealing with coming into a flow experience of the eternal present moment. We can find many of those teachings in Sidi Muhammad's books, where he has collected the teachings of the ages, and which we are encouraged to read and write this practice of reading and writing reinforces the teachings in a way that brings them into the heart through the hand. Then, after you've written, after you've read and then written, you let go of what you think you know, what you think you've learned, and do dhikr of Allah and you come into the annihilation, the fana, and he teaches you the deeper meanings of those teachings. Fasting and reducing habits are also practices of the sunnah. And for this, we are prescribed a retreat for, quote, taming the nafs, which includes much dhikr of Allah and an elongation of the weird. So you do maybe a thousand rounds of astaghfirullah al-adheem instead of a hundred. As well as practicing all of the sunnah additional salat, which there are many. <laughs> you can be doing like 50 rounds of salat in a day if you're practicing all of the sunnahs. Retreat is also a sunnah. For the angel Jibreel came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was in his habitual retreat in the cave of Hira. So again, ask your local community managers to support you in finding a place to do this kind of retreat. Inshallah, they can all direct you to some place nearby. So our guide also says that if you wish to have a rival at the waist, I'm getting most of these teachings from uh, this book, by the way, this is where I did the research for this talk. 
Walking the Path of Sufism with Sheikh Sidi Muhammad Saeed Al Jamal Al Rafai Al Shadali, which you can find on sufimaster.org, I believe. So he also says, know that if you wish to have arrival at the way stations of nearness in traveling to Allah with the Sufis, you need to overcome six obstacles. The first is weaning the limbs from Sharia violations. And the second is weaning them from customary habits. So these two obstacles correspond with that first aspect of the noble way of life. The third is weaning the heart from coarse humanity, which is vulgarity that comes from imitation of vulgarity. And for myself, I find that when I watch TV, I end up imitating the characters that I've watched on TV and their vulgarity. And the fourth is weaning the heart from its inclination toward natural impurities, which are hunger, comfort, sex, power, and wealth. And these are difficult because they are part of our human nature. The fifth obstacle, so five and six correspond with the hakika. The fifth obstacle is weaning the spirit from baseless suppositions and imaginings, which my, our guide chastise us about more than once, telling us, don't say that Allah shows me such and such, or don't tell people I see such and such. And the sixth is weaning the secret of the secret, from the illusion of other than Allah. And what is that illusion? That's the illusion of your own existence. And for this, the messenger of Allah says, die before you die. For refinement of the secret. Our guide says, we must completely detach ourselves and our hearts from the world and direct the mirror of our heart towards Allah alone. Die before you die. For that, Sidi Muhammad has prescribed the major solitary retreat, which is the definition of the word halwa which in our community, we use that word to describe a, uh, an all night prayer vigil. But this, this is a little bit different from that. So in the major solitary retreat, the devotee is in complete isolation and has no company from among the people. Ibn al-Arabi, describes this in his letter that was published under the title, The Journey to the Lord of Power. The formula for this retreat is similar to the retreat of taming the nafs, but it is done in solitude. And Sidi says, the legitimacy of spiritual retreat is affirmed in the Quran. When the youths said to one another, when you have withdrawn from them and what they worship besides Allah, Take refuge in the cave, and your Lord will spread out his mercy for you and provide you with ease in your situation. Dhikr of Allah, the meditation of chanting the name Allah, is prolonged in this retreat. And Allah says about this, So do dhikr of the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with utter devotion. He sets a limit and a condition for every type of worshipful act, except for dhikr, for which he set no limit and no condition. He says, O oh, you who believe, remember Allah with abundant dhikr and glorify him in the morning and the evening. 
So there is no upper limit to the amount of dhikr we can do. He also describes the people of dhikr, those who believe and whose hearts are made tranquil by the dhikr of Allah. Surely with the dhikr of Allah do hearts find rest. So to recap all of that, the beginning is purifying the outward through following the commands and avoiding the prohibitions. The middle is purifying the inward by aligning with the Quran and Sunnah. And the arrival is attained after the first two have been made complete by retreating from the world and seeking and traveling through the fana. Sidi Muhammad said, know that it is not possible to move on to the next station until you realize the prior station. Whoever is enlightened at his beginning will be enlightened at his end. You may not move on to the works of the tariqah until you realize the works of the sharia through which your limbs are purified. When you are complete with this and have purified your outward and have realized the enlightenment that comes from following the sharia, you move on to the work of the tariqa, which involves the infinite inward and purification of human attributes. When you are complete with this, you work on the spiritual attributes of adab, which is good manners the spiritual attributes of adab with Allah in his tajalli, which is his revelation of the creation. Then the limbs are at peace, and what persists is the best adab and alignment with the sharia, with piercing insight and universal support and strength. And with this, this is where you go back into the realm of the fiqh, of the jurisprudence, and each little tiny piece of fiqh becomes illuminated for you. And you realize the garden in every moment, in stepping foot into your house with your right foot first and your left foot second, or saying a'udhu billah when you go into a marketplace or a bathroom or so many little things that can become illuminated with this connection to Allah in the present moment. Sidi Muhammad, rahmatullah alayh, said, let it be known that no group among people has engaged so much in talking about divine love and annihilation in Allah as this group called the Sufis. The Sufi way, which is focused on the fana, is an area of study that concerns itself with the highest of character and morality. In the same light as the highest understanding from modern psychology and the scientific method and educational doctrine, we should consider the Sufi fana as a method of refinement and elevation unmatched by anything else. It is engaged in the annihilation of the passion of the nafs into something higher and more ideal the ever-changing present reality, the haq, which contains all of the divine realities. As Al-Junaid said, all movements of the Sufi are in agreement with the haq. And this is the meaning of the baqa. The Sufi lives in this baqa in the reality of Allah, for Allah, and by Allah. 
this elevation of human existence is known only to the Sufis and their inheritors. From any of the true religions, they all have Sufis. It is an ascent to completion, to the prolonging of a perfect moment, an elevation that is propelled by wings that take one to the most holy celestial horizons in which one takes on the lordly character traits. And so Allah becomes the eyes with which they see and the ears with which they hear the hands with which they grasp. And if they say to a thing, be, it becomes so, because their will is no longer theirs, but it belongs to Allah. In closing, I want to say, return to your first love, my dears. Remember that which caught you and brought you to this most noble way of life. As Maulana Rumi says, let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. I promise it will not lead you astray. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, beloveds. Thank you, thank you.